Chapter 136 Designing new weapons turned out to be a lot harder than he had expected at first, with the curved sword being something of an outlier when it came to ideas. The main reason for this is the very nature of stat points, unlike back on earth people have a lot more strength and this leads to the accessibility of different weapons. As he unloaded all of the ore from the carts he found himself comparing the designs he thought up more with the games he played than any history lesson he learned. The simple truth being that adding a lot of steel to a weapon here wouldn't make it unbalanced or too heavy to lift like it was back in his old world. One of the first things to jump to his mind was the famous Japanese katana. The sword was iconic not only because of the amount of importance it held in Japanese history but also because of their prevalence in animation and fiction led to it being the sword type for elite skilled swordsmen. Here however the katana would only be good as a training weapon. A short single-sided blade could be easily taken advantage of. Better choices would end up being bigger and unrealistic looking weapons that already were created here by trial and error. The only reason his curved swords were so successful was their added utility to be able to grab and bypass armor too strong to cut. Three hours he spent on moving the ore and in that time he didn't manage to think of anything else that could be a useful innovation. With the job done he left his father to do the forging and headed towards the guard compound to meet with his brother who should be finishing his morning patrol shift in a few minutes. As he reached the main building he entered for the first time in a while. He had subconsciously avoided the place after having been brought here following his meeting with the vampire all those years ago. The place looked both different and very much the same. The layout of all the furniture on the reception floor had changed from how it was when he first started coming here to train, the desks and chairs however were all still the same ones he remembered, maybe with a few more scratches and dents. How can I help you, sir? The younger of the two receptionists greeted him as he was about to head towards the practice courtyard. Civilians aren't allowed past this point. Ah Ajax tried to think of the best way to explain so that he would get access without a whole lot of paperwork. Ajax, you here to see your brother, the other receptionist looked up. He was one of the members of the command staff during the skirmish and quickly recognized Ajax. Yeah, I'm leaving for the capital this week Ajax admitted cheerfully I got my training started in this courtyard after I turned 10 years old, thought I'd practice with my brother one more time, before who knows when I'll get the chance. Head on through the man gave him an approving nod. As he entered the courtyard Ajax, came across a nostalgic scene. It was the end of the combat tournament the new recruits were put through. Finding his brother among the people waiting for the training to be over on the side was easy. Despite wearing the same armor or having a unique physique fluffy suit out like a sore thumb. After the new recruits finished with their training the people coming off patrol split up into their preset training groups. All the pairing consisted of two people facing each other except for Tom who was facing down three people with Fluffy by his side. As they sprang into motion Ajax took a seat on the side to get a good view of the action. With Fluffy now being the equivalent of a level 25 and Tom having reached level 24 they were on the back foot against three level 25 people. Not only that but their opponents were also quite a bit older, meaning they had been part of the guard for a while and had experience working together. In order to stand a chance Tom and Fluffy had to rely on the novelty and magic of the Shadow Cat and their ability to cooperate. Being city guards the three were used to working together but didn't have all that much experience when dealing with tamed beasts. Fluffy quickly dashed and moved to flank them. Tom did his best to back away and circle away from Fluffy in an attempt to force them into splitting their focus and not letting them all three rush him at once. The idea worked, somewhat, as two of the three turned to deal with the large cat while the third rushed Tom. Clearly this wasn't the first time they played out this exact scenario. The training blades clashed against each other once before both took a defensive formation and brought their shields in front for cover. Tom stopped retreating however and went for a shield charge. It was decently successful at knocking his opponent off balance as the shields hit each other. Tom took that moment to try and slice at his now exposed leg but the slice was parried awkwardly. Seeing his opponent on the back foot, Tom pressed his advantage with a shield bash whose sole purpose was to stop his opponent from getting his shield back in position. Knowing he didn't have time to spare Tom used his sword as a throwing weapon, if a poorly thrown one. Despite the element of surprise his adversary managed to knock it aside with his own sword. The throw did serve its purpose though as it distracted the guard long enough for Tom to tackle him to the ground and bring out the knife from his belt and place it at his throat. I'm out the man admitted with a disappoint smile while making sure to keep his neck very still as the knife wasn't a dull training blade. Tom wasted no time in rolling off his foe and picking up his tossed blade, but by the time he was back on his feet he saw two more guards heading towards him with Fluffy laying down behind them and his hind paw slightly tangled in Ebola. From there the fight ended quickly with the two guards using their number advantage to come at Tom from both sides ending the bout. 
with the bout over Ajax finally made to approach them before they started another. You guys have space for one more? Ajax asked them as they gathered around Fluffy and untangled his paws without cutting the bola. Sure, one of the three nodded. The one who nodded had known Ajax already but the other two were unfamiliar with him, now that they were back in the city commander Grievous men started mixing with others for training and patrol. The other two didn't seem to be against it but they looked skeptically at Ajax. Think you can take all five of us? Tom asked, though he knew fully well Ajax could handle all of them without much difficulty now just from how high his stats must be. Think it'll be best if we have a two on four and I don't use any magic. Ajax offered. Even only counting his physical stats Ajax had gotten to the point of reaching a level 35 pure warrior. With his magical stats added on he was closer to a level 60 adventurer. As Tom would remain with Fluffy, only the guard who knew him was comfortable pairing up with Ajax for the two on four. Grabbing a blunted sword and a shield Ajax took his stance and locked his eyes on Fluffy. From what he saw earlier he knew Fluffy was actually the one his teammate would have the biggest problems with. Without his magic Tom and the other two could most likely stall him if not beat him and Fluffy would only join once the side battle finished to put the final nail in his coffin. Since this was only practice and one he decided to go for more as a goodbye to his brother Ajax didn't switch to, berserker style, as he would in a real fight with these odds. The quick dash towards the shadow cat was interrupted by Tom, who clearly saw his plan. The exchanges between Ajax and the three guards who surrounded him looked very different from the previous fight Tom had been a part of. Every swing of the blade or bash of the shield sent a person off their feet. The difference in stats forced them to deflect blows if they didn't want to get crushed. Despite their appropriate reaction to his power Ajax could see both of the other guards had their eyebrows joining their hairline at his display of power. The fight didn't take all that long, Ajax had learned how to use his, deception, skill to increase how believable his fakes looked. It was also something that Tom, being the most inexperienced of them, had no practice against. By the time Fluffy won the side fight Ajax had taken two of them out of the fight at the cost of his shield arm and was in the process of overwhelming the third. You've grown quite a lot from the runt who used to get his ass kicked in this very courtyard not too long ago, a voice came from behind Ajax after spar ended. Ajax was a little surprised, being in a training courtyard he wasn't quite as careful about people approaching yet someone had gotten within striking distance of him and he hadn't noticed. All three of the guards, Tom and even Fluffy in her own way threw a salute towards the person now standing behind Ajax. Why don't you and I have a round? Commander Grievous suggested with a friendly yet slightly mischievous smile. Chapter 137. Grievous POV I looked down upon the courtyard, a habit I picked up back when I first joined the army. The only difference was that back then I was looking and trying to learn and now I'm inspecting how my own people advance and what help they need that I can get for them. One of the first things I picked up in the army was that so long as you are a little picky, people who come from small villages to join the guard are the easiest to build loyalty with. Even now if my old sergeant was to ask me for something there are few things I would refuse. My gaze was locked onto a sparring match for the last few moments. Just from a glance it would look highly mismatched, but I knew better. Ever since the small skirmish expedition took place I had kept an ear out for the young kid and what else he could get done. As the fight began a lot of the information I had was being both confirmed and missing. He was clearly very high level for his age, something that would serve him well as the sooner you start stacking that vitality the earlier the aging process is slowed. His level however is the only thing that somewhat matches the information I have. I would place him somewhere in the low 30s range for a balanced warrior build, maybe a bit focused on vitality. The information however classified him as a hybrid fighter, is he just building his magical stats through sheer practice and looking to keep progressing with free points for as long as he can? He would easily be at 50 across the board if that was the case yet I can't feel any magic from him. The fight draws to an end much closer than I would have thought, though his team did when his partner was taken out and he would be left with some massive injuries. I decided that was enough spectating and I should take a look for myself at what he can do and jump down. You've grown quite a lot from the runt who used to get his ass kicked in this very courtyard not too long ago. I say once I land silently behind him, enjoying the way he twitches in surprise. All the guards present, give me a salute, but I remain focused on the adventurer who is said to have been to the second floor of the dungeon repeatedly. Why don't you and I have a round? I offer. Sure he agrees after a few seconds of indecision and a look towards his brother. As the rest of the people back up to give us some space we square off against each other. I feel my skill, vigilant, let me know that he just used, judge threat, on me. Sadly despite it being a rare skill it doesn't provide any protection against identifying skills, all it does is let me know who it is and what skill they are using on me.my interest is peaked however when I feel, spot weakness. 
not letting overconfidence get to my head I use my own, judge threat, on him in return and am surprised to feel that he poses a large danger to me. I used the same skill on him a few months back when he joined our unit and he was barely a slight threat. Ready? One of the guards on the side asks, deciding to referee the spar. Ready he says as I start feeling some mana start to gather around him with, detect mana. I simply nod and wait for the signal to start. The moment the referee waves his hand I explode forward, letting, charge, take me right up to him and swing an overhead blow with my axe. I can see the shock in his eyes as he barely manages to move his head out of the way and lifts his shield to deviate the strike to the opposite direction. As the blow connects his hand gives way to my superior stats and he rolls away to create some distance. I can't help but feel a little disappointed. He moves the same way he did in the previous match, I thought that maybe there was something he was holding back that let him enter the second floor of the dungeon, but perhaps I should go a bit easier on him, after all I do have at least 20-something levels on the kid, not to mention the skills that I have polished for more than twice the time he's been alive. As all this is running through my head the amount of mana I sense suddenly spikes and, danger sense, alerts me in time to bring up my own shield as slash from his sword comes straight for my neck. His speed is on a whole other level now, moving even faster than I can, not only that but I can feel the cold seeping into my arm through the shield where his blow connected. Well that's rare. I hear myself subconsciously mumble, a mana skill that allows physical enhancement. It's not something unheard of but definitely one of the things the nobles try to keep to themselves. I don't have time to say any more as I find myself on the back foot for the first time in quite a while. The mana in the surrounding area increases further and he starts pressing me back. His speed and strength are now even higher than my own and it takes all I can do to deflect his onslaught of attacks. As if that wasn't enough the elemental nature of his attacks changes from one swing to the next, my shield hand is slowly starting to numb from the cold while my axe handle is about to burst into flames from the heat. That's not all he is doing either as I feel the earth beneath us move, trying to trip me up as well as give him a better footing. The one bright side to this is that I know he can't keep this up for long, just the boosting skill, should be eating through his mana like a pack of starving wolves let alone the rest. He quickly comes to the same realization as I do and decides to switch to a fully aggressive style. He throws away the shield and takes out a hammer before charging me again. I see through his feint and move with him as he dashes to my left trying to sidestep my shield. The sweat coming off his body letting me know just how much of a toll this is taking on him. As I parry the sword with my axe I tank the hammer blow on my shield but for some reason I easily rebuff the hammer at the moment of contact. An instant later I feel a sharp pain as the whole arm goes numb. My eyes catch a coating of dark mana that enveloped the hammer fading away. With this strike I know I am in a bad position, I never expected him to push me this hard. I'll have to apologize to everyone after this I resign myself as I draw in a deep breath. Rahabello comes out of me as I use my soul epic skill, debilitating shout. The debilitating effect works perfectly on him as he almost loses his balance giving me a much needed break. As I see him stumbling for a second step I take the chance to go on the offensive again but he quickly rebuffs me with a strong blow that creates a small explosion as our weapons collide. Each of us slide to a stop breathing heavily as we keep our eyes locked on each other, only to be interrupted as the referee intervenes putting an end to the match. Sorry about the shout everyone. I quickly get that out of the way as I look around to see that more than one or two people have ended up falling, the shadow cat is laying flat with both paws covering its ears. Despite all this my eyes don't leave the clearly exhausted young man that relaxed his stance as he was swarmed by his brother and the rest of the people who knew him, all of them congratulating and questioning him about his magic. Despite not being able to keep it up for very long, nothing more than a minute or two he was quite some ways above me, his lack of skills made up for the variety of his magic and inflated stats, I would place him somewhere around level 65 in terms of strength, if he is able to keep that up for longer than 2 minutes I doubt I would be left standing. I jump back up to my office to catch my breath, but I'm still tracking him with my eyes as he says his goodbyes and turns to leave the courtyard. I make a mental note to keep an eye on his family after he leaves the city. Chapter 138 Ajax POV sorry about the shout everyone, is the last thing Commander Grievous says before he leaps back up to the open window. I am very much still unsure what happened, after the first strike I had the upper hand during the entire match, not once did any of his counters do more than just lessen the pressure I was putting on him. Even now the dizziness hasn't fully dissipated, and more than that I didn't feel any mana at all. This could only mean that this wasn't a mana-based attack. From the fact that it affected everyone, if to a lower degree than me meant it was most likely a physical skill. That it messed with my senses and head without mana meant I, as I was, had no defenses for any such skills. This is something I will definitely have to look into fixing, and soon. That was amazing. How did you do that? 
The commander actually looked hurt at the end there. The exclamations and whispers started all around me. The last one got my attention, it seems people didn't get as good a read on the fight as I thought. Sure my last attack is the only one that actually got through to do physical damage to the commander, but I know for a fact his armor needs to be sent to a blacksmith for repairs after the blows it took. That really was something little brother. Tom congratulated me, he was crouching by Fluffy and giving her a scratch, it seems she got hit worse than everyone by that shout. It definitely took a lot out of me. I admit looking at my mana and stamina 850-2250 and 600-1850. End of POV with that Ajax, gave a hearty goodbye to his brother and the rest of the guards he knew and then headed back home. The afternoon was reserved for his mother as they would go shopping for all the provisions he would need, not only for the road but also to get started once he gets to the capital. The two of them are strolling through the market district with Ajax dragging a small cart behind him. Most of his essentials were already taken care of, his sister and Alana had already gotten the rations sorted, his father had already done a final repair and maintenance on his armor and weapons and Katie had already packed a full set of medical supplies. Let's get you a decent map. His mother offered and dragged him towards a little out-of-the-way shop that was tucked in a corner, welcome, what can I get you? The unenthusiastic greeting came shortly after the bell at the entrance announced them. We're here for a map. Sylvia said as she started looking at all the different odds and ends the store had. Surprisingly this store had quite a lot of different wares, from the ropes, pikes, tents and other such supplies Ajax put together that they must cater to travelers. I might be able to help you with that, what region are you looking for? The merchant looked like someone breathed life back into him at the news. A map of Grinder his mom said, then after a second of pause she added, We're not all that interested in perfect geographical accuracy as we are with the territory spread. The man nodded at that and headed into the back as Ajax turned to his mother. Isn't a map used for its geographical accuracy, surprised at her request. Any map you can get in this place, you can find one that is twice as cheap and three times as accurate once you actually get to the capital, not to mention that you'll be following big roads to get there, no real danger of getting lost, she patiently explained to him. Then why get a map at all? Having just blown through thousands of golds he found himself being much more frugal. The other thing you'll be doing on your trip is getting very bored. Some of the time you'll be spending with your caravan can be put to good use. As she spoke the shop owner, came back with three of the biggest maps Ajax had ever seen in his hands. Here we are, he said, placing them on the counter. I have three different maps that show territory, one at two silver, ten silver and fifty silver. Instead of looking at the maps for more than a cursory glance followed by a small nod Sylvia turned to look at the merchant. Which of these is the most recent? The merchant's wince at the question was rather pronounced despite his best attempt to keep his face from showing his feelings. This one, he said pointing to the ten silver one. We'll take it for eight, his mother's voice changed a little and he knew she was putting her merchant skills to work. Having spent the last six months in the city with no children to raise her merchant skills had gotten quite the workout and were showing a growth almost comparable to Ajax's own. The merchant tried to offer a counter-offer but the best he could do was open and close his mouth a few times until he finally got out an eight and a half. Deal, his mother said and started folding the map as Ajax placed the coins on the counter and left for home. Now Ajax, Sylvia started once they were out of the shop. The capital is going to be a very different place. It is filled with representatives of all sorts of noble families, most often looking to get one up on one another of similar standing. This map isn't for you to use in case you get lost. It's for you to study and get a general idea of who the archdukes, dukes, marquis and barons are and where their lands are. Most importantly the map also has their house sigils. This was something Ajax had overlooked. His focus on training and gaining strength had left a gaping hole in his preparations. The protection he benefited from here wouldn't extend in the capital, while he wouldn't have to go into hiding or anything he would have to pay more attention to noble families. One look at the map once they got home and Ajax could already tell that very little effort went into the geography of it. Most rivers, hills, forests were evidently wrong and the scale of some were much smaller or larger than the reality and this was just from his quick view of the areas he had seen on other maps. Point one his final night in the city was spent at his parents' house, both he and Hatchet would sleep here tonight and leave early the next morning so the entire family gathered for an early dinner. Everybody showed a happy and encouraging attitude but most of the people at the table thought it was still a little too soon for Ajax to be heading off. The exceptions were Tom and Katie. Katie because she best recognized how quickly the entire family would need to relocate from this backwater region and Tom because of Ajax's performance against the commander. Ajax are you still awake? His mother knocked gently on his door a few minutes after he headed off to bed. Yeah, come in, he answered. 
As his mother walked into the room her face betrayed that she was fighting a battle with herself. Is everything all right? He was slightly worried now looking at her face. What? Oh, everything is fine she forced a wry smile on her face. I know I never went into all that much detail about my family before, she started as she clenched her first around whatever was inside. But I think now is the time to tell you a little bit. When I decided to leave with your father my family cut me off. She took a deep breath. That isn't to say they disowned me, just that so long as I kept to this decision I wouldn't have access to any help or support from them. A few months ago I learned that they were still keeping an eye on me. A letter came in from my parents asking if I needed some help to get back on my feet after the attack on the village. After all this time I have no intention of relying on them for support, she said with conviction as she opened her hand to present a token with an emblem marked into it. This is the insignia of the Open Plains Trading Company that my parents gave to me and I want you to have it. They were just some middle-level merchants back then, but even if that hasn't changed you'll still be able to get a better-than-average price on anything you may need to sell with less questions asked about how someone of your level managed to delve that deep into the dungeon. Ajax took the offered token but didn't have time to process everything as his mother gave him a hug and left the room. Chapter 139 The following morning Ajax woke up early from one of the most restless nights he had in a while. He still wasn't sure what to do about his grandparents and the connection they represented with the Open Plains Trading Company. In the morning his mother made no more reference to what she said last night and didn't act any differently but if her bloodshot eyes were any indication she didn't get much sleep last night. The morning passed by in a blur as he said a quick final goodbye to everyone before he left with Hatched while pulling a small cart filled with all their luggage. Both him and Hatchet walked in a comfortable silence, neither feeling the need to make awkward conversation after their years as teacher and student. Ajax, you made it. Bobby greeted him as they arrived at the caravan. Who's the old man? Ajax and the collectors had made travel plans together even after they went their separate ways after their final dungeon run. As of now Ajax was a solo adventurer and no longer registered as a member of the collectors with the guild. This is Hatchet, Ajax said as he started loading their packs. He was my teacher back in the village. Ajax didn't want to say any more, he knew that Hatchet was fairly convinced his friend in the capital would help him regrow his lost arm, but it wasn't for him to share. Bobby, nice to meet you, the big man said, offering his hand. You did a hell of a job with Ajax here. Nice to meet you. Hatchet responded. Hey, I'm not paying for you to stand around and talk, get everything put away and we can get moving, a short rotund man shouted at them. This was the biggest difference between Ajax and the collectors right now. When Ajax and Hatchet got their passage on the caravan by simply being adventurers, the collectors took a job to offer them protection for the journey. Ajax didn't know why they would bother with a job that would pay so little. Considering that almost all adventurers were given free passage with any caravan for one simple fact, that they would provide protection if they were attacked, not out of any duty but because the attackers would not ignore them. How come you took the job defending them? Ajax asked Nelly once they finished loading everything and the caravan got moving. Tristan she said, pointing to a young man that resembled her. He doesn't have many missions completed with the guild, and no protection ones at all. This one will be good for his record now that we are moving. Ajax frowned a little at the news. He hadn't thought about that when he made his travel plans, after all while he did have quite a number of missions completed with the collectors all of them were dungeon related. You don't have to worry about that kid. Hatchet said he was one of the few people who still referred to Ajax as kid. You're not a healer so your mission escorting people through the dungeon's second floor is so much more impressive that doing another mission like this won't matter. He's right, Nelly nodded. Especially if you are willing to advertise that you can do some healing on the side. Despite having whispered the last part, Hatchet was a former scout and his perception was high enough to have heard it. He was mildly surprised at the news, he knew it would be a possibility considering that Kate was a healer and Ajax had access to his mana but he didn't expect he picked up enough to be useful in just a few months. At least not with how often he went to the dungeon. The first few days of the trip weren't that bad. The reason why Ajax chose this caravan specifically was that it was one that moved at a higher speed, a normal caravan would make the trip from Lessis to the capital in a little over two months whereas they would do it in three weeks, the boredom was however starting to get to him. For the first few days he talked a little with Tristan, despite the man being close to 30 years old he was quite a bit younger than everyone else in the collectors and he was just starting out as an adventurer so he had quite a bit in common with Ajax. Tristan was very excited after his first dungeon run despite having contributed little, as a healer he was mostly there in case things went bad. Jones was the other person who spent quite a bit more than usual talking to Ajax. More than anyone else on the team, besides maybe Nelly, he had watched Ajax's growth over the last few months. 
He was sure that he had outgrown their team, if only just, and was looking to keep a good relationship with a future powerhouse. Unlike in Lessis the capital had a wide enough range in the power of adventurers that delegating missions was very widespread. Certain jobs would have tasks that didn't require a person of the level contracted to handle and they would have weaker teams do them for a cut. Jones was hoping to have the collectors become one of Ajax's go-to teams in a few years. Having run out of topics to talk about and with his mana sitting at a little under half after finishing his mana training Ajax finally decided to study the map his mother got him. It would be a long journey and he had been planning to leave learning about the nobility boundary lines for later but he had nothing better to do. As he spread open the map and took a closer look at the capital a few things stood out to him. First all the major roads and quite a bit around them were the property of the royal family. He suspected this was done for military reasons, he was also wrong as the roads all belonged to the royal family to ensure that no other nobles put extreme taxes on traveling merchants. The other thing that stood out to him was how almost every Marquis Duke and Archduke seemed to have a small plot of land no bigger than his village somewhere around the capital. This was the land for the mansions these families had. He had learned through reading that this was done to ensure each noble could have the rules governing their territory apply there. The next thing he noticed was the sheer volume of noble families that existed in the kingdom. His history from earth led him to believe that in medieval times there were very few nobles, this was very much not the case here, with multiple families having access and ruling over the same territories, each with a specific family nominated by the royals as being currently in charge. What Ajax didn't know was that this world had one issue stopping it from following in earth footsteps when it came to noble families wiping each other out as they took over territory. This was that the strong and talented people would reach higher levels and as such live longer. With the best and brightest of each family living longer it made wiping out one another much more difficult and a new system was needed. In Grinder this took the form of royal family nomination. After a few hours of studying the map and doing his best to memorize names, locations and how sigils Ajax felt a headache coming on. The sheer number and minute differences in sigils made learning this a real pain. Knowing the importance of this knowledge however Ajax was determined to set aside a few hours each day for the reminder of the journey to study. The first two weeks of the trip passed without anything of note happening. They would frequently run into wild animals and monsters but the highest they encountered was a single level 50 that resembled a rhino at the end of the first week. The beast had some power but was quickly brought down without much effort. When Ajax asked why they didn't encounter anything else like that or something stronger he was quickly informed that the royal family had soldiers patrol the roads to ensure safe passage. They had in fact met one such group a few days after and the merchants had quickly taken the opportunity to try making a quick sale. Everything seemed to take a turn for the worse as they approached the city of Lorden. It was their last stop before they would arrive at the capital. Chapter 140. It had already been two days since they hadn't seen anyone coming or going on the road. This wasn't all that odd by itself as in the middle of their second week they had three days where nobody else approached them. The difference now was that they were within half a day's journey of a rather big city and having nobody traveling in their direction meant one of two things. First something happened in the direction they are coming from and nobody wants to go there. This is very unlikely to be the case as they hadn't noticed anything amiss. The second option is that something happened up ahead that stopped people from coming this way and it was the most likely of the two. Far in the horizon the silhouette of the impressive wall surrounding Lorden could be seen atop the hill even through the foliage they were surrounded by. The city wasn't fully contained inside the massive walls as Lorden was also a keep but the surrounding city and smaller walls were blocked from sight by the trees. Despite being a forest road, this was an official road and the caravan easily spread to moving their carts in double columns and still only took up half the road. As the trees were about to give way a small contingent of guards appeared blocking the path. Halt the one marked with the rank of captain shouted. Being part of the same kingdom, all city guards shared the same command structure, with basic guards, sargets, captains, majors, commanders and finally a warden overseeing each city. It was odd to see a captain leading only two squads outside the gates of the city, not only that but the state of their armor left quite a bit to be desired. Start getting your armor on. Hatchet whispered to him. As the cart they both traveled on was towards the end of the caravan they were out of sight and Ajax started tightening the straps of his gear without questioning Hatchet. What is going on, he whispered back after he was fully equipped and had both his hammer and axe ready. His sword would be the least effective against the heavy armor of the group stopping them, so he went with the other weapons. Something isn't right. Hatchet answered they have too few men for a captain to be present, not only that but their gear is a little uncared for them to be guards. As Ajax was getting ready and discussed things with Hatchet the group blocking their path wasn't sitting still. 
The leader was talking to the head of the convoy as well as Jones at the front, but the rest of the men started surrounding the caravan. Be careful and stand ready, one of the caravan guards who wasn't part of the collectors called out from behind Ajax. The shout put everyone on edge as weapons were pulled out of their sheaths and combat stances were taken while most of the merchants huddled towards the middle. Ajax wanted to pull out his bow but wasn't comfortable leaving Hatchet to fend for himself with just one arm, so he put himself between him and the closest surrounding guard with axe and hammer in hand. The guards also drew their weapons at the shout, but surprisingly they backed away slightly instead of swarming them with the element of surprise. The guard standing a few feet from Hatchet took one look at Ajax and his eyebrows made a break for his hairline as his eyes threatened to pop out. What's happened? Jones shouted from the front as he pulled the convoy head back and placed himself between him and the man dressed as a captain. They're inspecting us with some skill. The veteran guard shouted back and this made all the caravan defenders take a stronger defensive formation as well as putting them on edge. We have a three bar here, the man closest to Ajax called out as all the guards close to them backed up further and took a glance towards him. Ajax knew exactly what that meant. It was code for someone that needed to be handled by a captain. He knew this because his brother was part of the guards and he taught him most of the codes while he lived with him. But this begged the question, if they really were guards, what were they doing? Everyone stand down. The voice of the captain wasn't loud, but it carried clearly all the way from the front to the back of the caravan, doubtless a skill was involved. I am Captain Dorian Grasswealth from the city of Lorden. We mean no harm to anyone and are here only to ensure that the caravan stops at the gates of Lorden. With that statement he unstrapped the sword from his side and handed it off to one of the guards near him, before approaching Jones and the head of the convoy once more with his hands slightly raised in a placating gesture. Ajax took this time to quickly start firing off, judge threat, at the surrounding guards. Most of them came back as a low threat. Ajax judged them to be somewhere in the low 40s, the one exception was the man marked as a sergeant whom he judged to be in the low 50s. The sergeant also frowned and locked eyes with Ajax a moment after he used his skill on him, letting Ajax know that his actions were noticed. Let's head up there. See what is happening Hatchet said as he placed his arm on Ajax's shoulder. This broke the stare down between him and the sergeant and the two headed up to where Jones was. Just here to ensure nobody is taking a detour, the captain was saying. You also won't be able to enter the city. What, that makes no sense, the caravan leader said, but both Jones and Hatchet frowned at the words. The city is under quarantine, the captain continued. Nobody is allowed to enter or leave. That being said, we are in need of supplies as such you will be stopping at a safe distance from the gates where you will be uploading some of your wares. Oh no I will not. One of the merchants that had gathered some courage to step away from the huddle in the middle all but shouted from behind Ajax as he heard the conversation. Here is an order signed by Duke Axbain. It is by his authority that provisions be appropriated from merchants, all inventory is to be recorded and compensation for it can be collected either in the capital or any other city in his territory. The captain produced a scroll filled with small print and a large emblem at the bottom. Ajax recognized the sigil of House Axbane from his studies of the map during the journey. Lead on captain. Jones spoke up before anyone else could say anything after he took a quick glance at the document. Everyone get moving, we are to stop a little outside the gates of the city. That is not your decision to make, the caravan leader growled at him. It very much is. Jones answered in a cold tone. Should you or the other merchants decide not to follow my advice, and that is what it is, advice, then you shall do so by yourselves. We were hired to protect you from bandits and beast not fight a lawful order. Ajax had no idea what the big issue was. From his perspective everything was odd, but not so much as to prompt this response from the merchants. Nevertheless that was not his issue as Hatchet led him back towards their cart. Their driver was one of the first to move as he exited the formation and headed to the front of the caravan as the rest of the cart slowly started moving. A few minutes later they were all stopped outside the gates. Looking inside through the gates Ajax saw all the way down one of the main streets of the city. It looked like a ghost town with nobody walking in the street despite it being almost evening, a time when most got off work and headed for the tavern. Unload your food and drink. A guard said as he approached the cart noticing that Ajax, Hatchet, nor anyone else was taking things off their cart. We are not merchants Hatchet answered back. We are simply traveling with the caravan. Your employer can resupply further down the road adventurer. The guard moved forward aggressively only to find himself pulled back by his partner whose eyes were locked on Ajax and the hand he rested on the hammer's handle. Ajax wasn't even following the conversation, he trusted Hatchet's judgment in this situation. Instead he kept his eyes on the guards and was ready to engage at a moment's notice should the situation turn violent. Chapter 141
The situation was tense, yet both sides were somewhat mirroring each other. Ajax and the less experienced of the two guards were both on the edge of turning the situation physical, the tense atmosphere getting to them a little. The more experienced guard and Hatchet were determined to talk it out peacefully. The differences came from who was doing the talking for each side, and the power they had, the experienced guard's eyes had not left Ajax, despite paying close attention to the conversation. We aren't here as hired guards. Hatchet calmly stated, though he couldn't hide the smile that crept on his face at the wary look the guard was giving his student. We are here as passengers, these are our provisions, and the order your captain read only appropriate goods from merchants. Hatchet had also pulled out the two tickets from one of the bags and extended them to the guards. Both tickets were rather odd as they stated a charge of zero coins paid to gain them. Both of these say you are traveling for free, the guard accused. Where did this caravan start? His partner cut him off, though more guards started closing in on their position. We started in less sis. Hatchet answered as he awkwardly twisted the tickets in his hands to point where the name was written. And you expect us to believe they let you come along free of charge? He asked, though in a much calmer tone than the first guard whose face was getting red. A common practice for strong adventurers, at least out in the backwaters. The captain's voice sounded from behind two of the other guards who closed in on the commotion and parted once they heard his voice. What is the problem here? They are refusing to unload the supplies, sir, the guard answered. As I was telling your subordinates, as we are not merchants the order does not compel us to give any of our supplies. Hatchet stated. The captain barely gave Hatchet a second look before he took a glance inside the cart. This was also the most likely reason why the guards weren't just letting this go. Inside the cart Hatchet and Ajax had enough provisions to last the entire caravan a week if not more. He had argued the need for such preparations, but his mother and sister would hear none of it. So you claim you brought all this food for the two of you, even the captain raised an eyebrow at the statement. He would have been more aggressive had it not been for his truth-sensing skill indicating no deception. How do you explain that? Hatchet's grin turned a little teasing, and without saying anything he just turned to Ajax and nodded at him. This is my first time heading on such a long trip. Ajax rambled on with some embarrassment. My mother and sister are both merchants by trade, they saw to it that we were fully stocked when we left. The captain was now in an awkward position. He was pretty sure that what they were saying was the truth. The problem was they also really needed the food supplies, supplies that the one-armed adventurer was correct in stating they had no right to take. After a couple of minutes of silently thinking the matter over, the captain finally decided on a course of action. All right. He nodded to Hatchet. The order does indeed not cover their supplies. Let them go. Despite the flabbergasted looks on some of the guards, they all backed away obediently. Make sure to take more from the merchants, with that supply in their midst we don't have to worry about starving them. Not only that, but it might also display some of their anger from us to them, just because they got to keep it. The captain whispered his new plan of action in a quiet voice, but it wasn't enough for Ajax to not pick it up. He frowned and was about to say something about the shady practice, but Hatchet motioned to him to let it go. But why, he asked. The food is most likely not for the city. Hatchet explained. We haven't heard anything about this situation, this means that it has been going on for at most a month. That is not enough to even get close to emptying the food stores of a city like Lorden. If they still have food, why are they taking it like this? Best guess? Hatchet paused to order his thoughts. This plague is not natural, most likely it has someone behind it. With skills amplifying it and a bad actor, it might not be safe for the healthy guards who are needed to keep what remains of the piece to eat anything from storage. The explanation was not something Ajax expected. His experience from Earth had given him a certain base understanding of plague and disease, but he hadn't thought of how magic could affect that. Unlike on Earth here skills and magic could be used to enhance the plague, not just cure it. During their discussion almost all of the remaining supplies the merchants had were taken off the carts and split into two piles. 
one was taken off to the side towards the outside of the city and a small makeshift camp, the other was taken halfway to the city gates before being stacked up neatly and then backed away from. Once the guards had backed away from the second pile, six guards approached from the city gate and moved to collect the food. These guards looked better than the ones who had been standing outside. Their armor was polished and neat, yet despite that their faces looked haggard. The quiet tense atmosphere went to hell when one of the new six guards broke out in a coughing fit. Contrary to what he had seen the guards always do up until now, when one of their own was in trouble, they all quickly backed away fear etched on their faces. And that all but confirms my theory. Hatchet said as the soldier slowly got his coughing under control and headed back towards the city without stepping one foot closer to the food. We thank you for your understanding. The captain's voice resounded just like it did when he stopped the caravan. We wish you safe travels as you move forward towards the capital. The captain had quite a few scrolls he was giving out to each merchant, Ajax assumed that it was a receipt of sorts for the goods they had each given up. He was surprised however to see Jones also be given a scroll. With this the caravan got moving again, though everyone was in poor spirits after the whole fiasco. With morale this low and the sun coming down a decision was made to make a camp instead of pushing through the night. They happened across a good spot with maybe an hour or so of light still left as they started making a fire. Is it that big a deal that they lost these contracts? Ajax asked Hatchet as they were getting ready to eat. Nobody can blame them for not fulfilling them because of what happened and they technically sold everything. The problem is who they sold it to. Jones said as he and the caravan leader approached Ajax and Hatchet. You see, the scrolls given indicate what the items were, but there is no set price. That would have to be bartered for whoever the representative they go to collect from is, he will definitely have much stronger skills and would mean a much lower profit. Not only that, but without the item present certain comments about the quality can be made with no proof backing them and we can't really walk away from the deal. The caravan leader added on though it looked more like he was complaining to himself rather than explaining to Ajax. That's under usual circumstances. With Duke Axbane looking to take over as the new house steel blade, they are going to be even stingier than usual. Anyway. Jones quickly changed the topic before the caravan leader could go on another rant like the one he had to hear ever since departing from Lorden. Can we discuss sharing some of your supplies? They took quite a lot more than we expected. As usual Ajax wasn't about to handle this discussion. Despite some merchant skill that he had this was all best left to Hatchet while he would observe and learn. Hatchet didn't have a chance to answer, however, before Donnie approached Jones. Boss we got a group approaching, at least twenty maybe more, he reported. Most of them were the mark of the healing union, but the one in the front bears the sigil of House Axbain. Looks like we have to deal with that first Jones side as his hand went to the scroll he was given, and he started leading the caravan leader away from Ajax and Hatchet. Chapter 142 Jones POV Hearing there was a group approaching made me freeze for an instant. There are a couple ways that this could go bad for us. The most obvious is that this is a group of bandits, despite the most likely violent outcome this is then one I would prefer to go with right now since it is one we are likely to win. Anyone over level 40 with a few combat skills has no reason to turn to banditry this close to the capital. The second situation was that this was a fellow merchant caravan. This would be the worst situation for us as we could be tangentially blamed if they turned around to avoid the same supply seizure we just went through. Most of them were the mark of the healing union, but the one in the front bears the sigil of House Axbane. Donnie finished his report and I breathed a sigh of relief. Right now, I was patting myself on the back for my earlier decision of not interfering with the previous guards. Had I decided to stand up to them and refuse to hand over the goods this following meeting could have turned into our execution, as for whether we could stand up to them I would say it wouldn't have been a problem. They weren't in great shape to fight like we were and their levels were mostly in the low forties. A year ago I wouldn't have been so cavalier about the situation but in the last half a year our mentality and approach to diving changed ever so slightly. Ajax being with us and pushing so hard to progress had made us more competitive and determined, 
everyone gained at least a full level with some who were already close to leveling like me getting two. Excuse me, sir, I approach the man with House Axbane's sigil and wait for him to introduce himself. Leonard Smith, he said curtly. What do you want? He had taken a brief look around our camp and was already in a hurry to push forward. His name was Odd, for a warrior, which he clearly was, in service to a house having a last name could mean a few things, most of them prestigious. The name Smith however narrowed it down to his family having been in the house's service for at least one more generation before his, and the first being employed as a smith. I have a message for you. I quickly explained and offered the scroll I was given. A captain at Lorden told me to give it to the first party with Axbane's sigil I came across. We'll be camping here, for tonight, he called out to the rest of his group after he read the scroll. Would you mind sharing your camp? His question put us a little on the spot. I could see one or two carts with them, but all of them were filled with people, as it was we were already going to be asking Ajax and his teacher for food. Then again I knew that despite not having used any skill to judge the man's strength the quality of his gear meant he was at least level 100. We have our own supplies. A young woman said. No, it wasn't that she was young, my intuition pointed me to her being maybe older than I was, she just simply invested in vitality a lot more and a lot sooner than I had. Please, by all means. The caravan leader spoke up as soon as he heard the word supplies. I wasn't sure if he was aiming to have them share some of theirs or just that their presence would put pressure on Ajax and his teacher to share theirs, but his motivation of getting food was plain to see. End of POV Ajax and Hatchet watched as the whole group approached and started setting up next to the fire. Both had deep frowns on their faces that lessened when they saw the group pulling out their own supplies out of enchanted bags. Looking over the people of the group Ajax started using, judge threat, on them as they approached. Most came across as little to no threat, not surprising considering the healer robes they wore. The exception was the woman who seemed to be their leader as she was organizing them. She came back as a decent threat, not quite as strong as Grievous, but she wasn't far off. Bringing up the rear and joining Jones and the caravan leader were three men who all wore armor and the Axbane sigil. The ranking amongst them was obvious, and as Ajax inspected the one carrying a few packs, he judged him to be around a level 50 fighter. The second had come back as stronger than even Grievous. If he had to guess Ajax would put him at level 70, maybe even higher. Not only was he strong, but he also locked eyes with Ajax right after he used the skill. The brief flash of surprise on his face let him know that he was also inspected in some way. Moving on to the third man, who was still talking to Jones Ajax activated, Judge Threat, again. This time he didn't get any feeling of what power the man was on instead winced as he felt a brief spike of pain pulse through his temples. Well this is certainly interesting the third man was suddenly speaking from in front of him as he blinked. That's quite the level for someone so young looking. Would you mind telling me what house you work for Sir Ajax? Ajax froze up hearing the words. It wasn't fear that made him freeze, he had mentally prepared himself for this. He quickly sorted through the information the man revealed. First things first, he clearly knew his name, that, and his level. His way of addressing him, the comment about his age and the simple fact he was willing to stand so close to him told him a few things. First he couldn't see his age, and second, he assumed he was a physical fighter. He also guessed that he didn't get a good read on his true power or the reaction wouldn't have been so small. Most likely none of them had, judge threat. Silence it is then. The man continued after a short pause when Ajax didn't say anything and simply gave him a nod. He took a step away before turning and saying, My name is Leonard Smith. Should you be looking for more generous employment in the future, do look for me. House Axbane is always looking for talented young people. Ajax simply nodded slowly as he calmed down. It took almost a minute before he was once again aware of everything else that was happening around him and he stopped staring after Leonard. Unbeknownst to him Leonard took his actions as him thinking favorably about his offer and showed a small smile for the first time that night. Hatchet had not been standing idly by. 
While Ajax and the caravan leader had been interested in the approaching party and quickly approached the man's apprentice and worked out a very favorable deal for them to share their supplies. Jones and the caravan leader were surprised to see that everyone was already preparing to eat, but both had different reactions to the situation. While Jones just smiled, happy that he wouldn't have to help plead a case to Ajax for sharing the supplies, the leader frowned and headed for his apprentice. What happened with the supplies, the caravan leader asked in a hushed whisper once he dragged his apprentice into a tent, despite the silencing enchantment he still whispered as he wasn't too trusting and could fully block Leonard. The old man approached me to set up a trade, he said smugly. Greedy old bastard wanted to sell us the supplies for three times market prices in the capital. His merchant skills are so low that he couldn't even counter-offer anything after I said one and a half times. The caravan leader's face went through a few emotions, quickly, starting with anger, then to acceptance, and finally, to amusement. He's clever that one, he gave out a quick chuckle. What do you mean, the apprentice asked. The man is clearly not a merchant, he said as he cuffed the man around the back of the head. He likely doesn't have any merchant skills at all. He just realized the situation would force him to share the supplies and through a stupidly high number to get as good an offer as he could of you. Chapter 143 With hatchets having solved the food issues for the caravan until they reached the capital, there seemed to be no animosity towards Ajax and him from anyone except the apprentice merchant that got fooled. Do you know what type of plague it is, considering the makeup of your team and the precautions taken in the city, I assume it is helped along or even created by somebody. Hatchet broke the silence after he finished his portion. The plague itself is not that dangerous, the lead healer says after getting a nod from Leonard, besides some mild respiratory infection and some exotic ways of spreading, besides the mundane ones. Their combination actually makes stopping its spread quite difficult inside cities. A whole city went into quarantine because of something like the cold that spreads easier? Ajax's mouth got the words out before the brain could filter them. You seem to have some knowledge. No, the main side effect of the plague is what makes it so dangerous, it makes it so that stamina is no longer consumed by the infected, instead a person's vitality is very slowly used. Despite her warm tone, the words sent a shiver through everyone. Vitality was the only dump stat possible out of the eight. Putting all your points into vitality was, though stupid from a level of strength perspective, not going to cause side effects like the others, tearing the body apart without a more spread out investment. The loss of vitality like that would mean loss of levels and lifespan Ajax was no longer surprised that he hadn't seen anyone moving in the city, they were all tucked away in bed if they knew what was good for them. Those methods of transmission you mentioned, could you perhaps share what they are? The caravan leader asked with a shaky voice. I would also be interested in hiring your services before we go our separate ways tomorrow. You've no need to worry, none of you are infected, the healer said. Had even one of you been infected, I would have felt the magic of the disease spread through the air around before we arrived. As for the method of transmission, the mundane was airborne. The magical one is in fact based on sound. Anyone who hears an infected cough, without then looking at him, would also be infected, she offered. This is where Ajax felt completely out of his depth. A disease that spreads through sound. That was something else, even with the limitation of anyone that actually sees the source of the sound not getting infected all it would take is one person, coughing in the night from his bed, and everyone in the building near him would become infected. I think it best I turn in for the night, so I am ready to leave in the morning. Ajax said as he mechanically stood up. What kind of skill or magic would allow someone to give a disease, this kind of effect, was what occupied his mind now. Good luck, I hope you catch him quick, he threw out offhandedly as he made his way towards the cart. Sir Leonard Smith doesn't need to rely on luck, the young soldier piped in. We already know the ident dash. Enough, Leonard interrupted the man. The person's identity was a sensitive subject and one that shouldn't be broached in public. The young soldier realized his mistake as he bowed and apologized profusely. Deep down he was disappointed in himself, many times Leonard had told him to get control of his temper and yet again he had lost it, 
all because of a somewhat talented commoner refusing Leonard's offer of employment. The confused looks on everyone's faces let Leonard decide that clearing out the witnesses wasn't required. It was here that Leonard's skills failed him. Both Hatchet and the caravan leader had managed to school their expressions enough as to not give away the fact that they understood what was happening. Whoever the perpetrator was, Hatchet knew that he belonged to a high-up noble family, at least a highly influential marquee if not a ducal house. This was something he would have to look into discreetly once he made it to the capital, he knew his skills were not going to be enough for this so he would need to ask Luna. A heavy weight pressed upon his heart as he realized the first time he would see his old teammate and friend he would be showing up with two requests. Hatchet didn't know he was in fact wrong. His fear was that the perpetrator was the final living heir of a house and would be spared to preserve the house. This wasn't the case, yes the perpetrator was in fact the oldest heir to a powerful marquee family, but he wasn't the sole heir. The reason for the secrecy was to preserve the reputation of the marquee family. The rest of the night was spent in silence apart from the few times the caravan leader asked the healers if they were sure nobody was infected, despite their answer being negative, he still drank a potion. The following morning, the two groups split up, without much fanfare. The healers and the duke's men had their mission and the caravan continued on towards the capital. They made good time, knowing there wasn't any deal to be made at any of the villages in between them and the capital. The caravan was ready to simply go around them in hopes of saving time, but alas it was not to be. Ho there travelers, an old voice shouted towards the caravan. As the caravan slowly came to a stop, they could all see the food market that had been set up in this village. All of the stalls were filled with a minimal amount of unripe vegetables and fruit. The meat still looked the part at least, but it wasn't hard for any of them to figure out what was going on. You must be hungry after your journey, the old man continued with a fake smile as his eyes twinkled with greed. We might not have much, but we are prepared to share some with you, for a modest price, of course. It was clear that this village as a whole had probably received the same treatment as the Caravas and had most of their reserves taken away for the city. They in turn then turned to selling overpriced substandard foot to others who had suffered their fate at a premium. We are very thankful for your kind hospitality. The caravan leader called back without moving to get out of the caravan. Sadly we are in a hurry if we are to make it to the capital in five days so we won't be stopping at any of the villages in between here and there. The headman looked like he had taken a big bite from one of the unripe lemons sitting on the stand behind him as he watched the richest caravan he had seen since they were pillaged take off without waiting to buy anything. The caravan leader however was grinning like the cat that got the cream. There was no way he would be swindled by two people in two days, he thought to himself as the village was left behind in the dust. Not to mention that this old man was even greedier than the last one. With that thought he turned around and looked at Hatchet as he was talking with Ajax in their cart. It seems like our training has left quite a blind spot for you. Hatchet silently lamented. What do you mean? Ajax asked though he had an inkling of what he was referring to. Despite all our training and preparation in those five years it seems that you are still behind when it comes to common knowledge outside of that backwater barony, he explained the exact thing Ajax was now considering. I'm sorry to say that I don't have the experience to teach you what is possible with mana. It was written all over your face last night as you finally processed what other talented people could do with mana. Yes, Ajax agreed. I spent quite a bit of time last night wandering about magic gear as well as other more niche applications of mana besides elemental magic and healing. Its offensive use in alchemy is just one of probably many, how many other uses does it have that I haven't even thought about yet? Chapter 144 Ajax spent the last few days in an even split. Half the time he was pondering on all the different uses that magic might have. The other half of the time he spent cramming as much as he could about the noble territories, he felt he had a decent grasp on who they were and where they were, but matching a name to a sigil was still a challenge. As the caravan approached Ajax was awed by the sheer size of the city. With Lorden having turned them away, he hasn't gotten to see any other large city to put the capital into perspective. While the sheer size of the place was something to see, 
that was only when compared to everything else on this planet. Having gotten to experience cities like New York and Washington D.C. Ajax had seen much higher concentrations of humans. No, what drew his attention as he watched the city from above on a hill was the very clear progression the city took as it grew. In the center stood the Imperial Palace. Unlike a lot of the games he had played back on Earth, the palace was not a fortress, he felt a little disappointed by the fact, but it was still surrounded by a wall. From there three more walls formed rings that separated the city. Each ring had at one point been the outer wall of the city, but as the city's population grew they found themselves in need of more space. As with all cities, the caravan found itself waiting in a line at the gates to enter. From the looks on the faces of the merchants Ajax could tell that something felt wrong for them. He didn't manage to figure out that it was the lack of pressure. For the first time in a long time for some of them, they didn't have to be ready to haggle the tax or bribe down as much as possible before entering the city. After all, they had nothing with them to sell. Next, called the guard as another group of carts moved its way inside the city. With their caravan approaching the soldier seemed to take only one look at their group before a frown darkened his face. Hold, where are you coming from? We are coming from Lessis. The caravan leader responded, Less sis. Less sis, the guard mumbled as he ran through the map in his head, trying to figure out where it was that this caravan passed through. Hold to the side, he said with authority, as he finally placed the location of the city. We have a healer on standby, you can only enter the city after he confirms that none of you are infected with the plague. The loud proclamation grated on the hearts of all the merchants. Not only were they the merchants who showed up to the capital without any goods to sell, everyone in earshot would now spread rumors of how they had plagued. Couldn't he be a bit more discreet? One of the merchants bit back a curse. The healer quickly appeared and cleared them all for entry. Some of the merchants however were already demanding that the man sign a piece of paper to assure that they had been checked for the plague and found healthy. With the journey coming to an end Ajax and the collectors finally said their farewells. It's true that they will be operating in the same city and will most likely meet quite often, but none of them were under the illusion that they would be as they are now. All of them knew Ajax was no longer their equal, but their superior, and that he will quickly move up in the guild here as well. It was great having you with us kid, you definitely pushed us a lot further. Joan said as he shook Ajax's hand. But I think all of us are going to be happy to slow down a little and take advantage of the dungeon's lower level jump to progress. We all wish you good luck. Good luck to you guys as well. Ajax said as the collectors turned away and started heading towards the Adventurers Guild. Even as they walked away Ajax could hear Bobby going on about how they should hurry up to see what the noble families had gotten them for accepting Ajax. It was common to have such rewards or gifts left with Adventurers Guild to be collected upon completing the mission. Ajax and Hatchet on the other hand started heading in a very different direction. Both of them were headed towards the Healing Union. Unlike the Adventurers Guild, whose headquarters were on the outskirts of the Merchant Ring due to the location being close to halfway between the two dungeons, the Healing Union was deep in the noble section of the city. Surprisingly enough none of the guards guarding the inner walls gave either of them more than a second look before allowing them entry. From the slump to the middle class, and from the middle class to the merchants, both times the guards took one look at them and allowed them entry without much fanfare, clearly they looked like they belonged there. Halt a shrill voice that Ajax had recognized from his time on earth as corresponding to a middle manager drunk on a small amount of power. On whose authority do you enter the noble section? The captain on duty for the entrance to the noble section asked as Ajax and Hatchet approached. We are heading to the healing union. Ajax said as he motioned subtly towards Hatchet's missing hand. That wound looks healed, it's not a life-threatening injury. Not to mention that the healing union has small branches in the lower districts as well. He adamantly refused them entry. I am going to meet an old friend. Hatchet said as he used his only arm to bring out a letter from one of his pockets as he handed it to the man in charge. The man's smirk didn't seem to change at all for a moment as he started reading the letter, at least it didn't until he got to the end. Having finished the letter his smirk was gone and his complexion paled. Sorry for the delay, 
was all he managed to get out as he waved them through. The opulent wealth was truly on display as they made their way through the noble district. Unlike all the other districts, there were no shops here. All the buildings were residential and built to show off as much of their owner's wealth as possible. Outer walls were decorated with all sorts of precious gems and metals, so much so that Ajax briefly considered passing by here in the dead of night and trying to collect a few decorations. As they moved through closer to their destination Ajax had a hard time finding the building they were looking for. He knew that all of the healing unions used one of a few layouts based on how big they were, this was done to ensure efficiency by having all locations be similar for their traveling members. Here we are, Hatchet breathed a deep sigh. He hadn't been back here in more than forty years. It's certainly a little different than I remember. Both of them stood shocked in front of a building that was right at home in the noble district. Despite none of the walls being decorated with precious gems and metals all of the building materials were of high quality. Not only that, but unlike the rest of the branches of the Union, their headquarters actually spend a substantial sum on appearance and comfort. I thought all the branches of the Healing Union were minimalists? Ajax asked, a bit taken aback by the difference in what he expected to see and what he was seeing. Their headquarters was always a bit of an outlier. Hatchet responded quietly. Though it wasn't to this extent it had been a lavish place even last time I saw it. Apparently, they make a lot more money by spending some of it on comfort and aesthetics. It appeases the nobles and gets more of them to come here and spend a lot of money for their services. Unlike the people who passed them on the street, none of the people working in the healing union gave them as much as a look of disdain for how they looked after their travels. Despite being surrounded by opulent wealth it seemed that the employees were still the same dedicated kind healers Ajax had come to expect of the union. How can I help you? The receptionist asked as they reached her desk in the lobby. Are you perhaps looking to get that arm fixed? I'm sorry to say I can't afford the price of having the arm regrown. Hatchet said with a small shake of the head. I am here to see an old friend. He said as he reached for the letter once more. Hatchet is that you, a commanding but beautiful voice, resounded throughout the lobby. As Ajax turned towards the source he found himself looking at a beautiful woman with silver hair who looked to have been in her mid-thirties as she headed straight towards them with everyone else clearing a path for her. Luna, it's been a while. Hatchet said awkwardly as he turned to face her and scratched the back of his neck. Luna's steps almost faltered as she caught a glimpse of his missing arm. Her voice was just as melodious the second time, but now it carried a promise of violence as she asked, What happened to your arm? Chapter 145 The entire room felt like the temperature dropped severely from the statement. Despite the cold tone and violent presence Luna had carefully started unwrapping the bandage and examining the stump attached to Hatchet's shoulder. As for Ajax, he was still looking at Luna with shocked eyes. Hatchet had let him know that his friend in the capital would be able to help and that they were both once part of the same team, even if he was a bit older than her back, then the difference between them now was massive. While Hatchet had stagnated at what should have been the start of his career, his teammate had clearly pushed forwards. Which regrowth rooms are ready? Luna asked without taking her eyes off Hatchet. Luna, you don't hod dash Hatchet started to protest only to get a light smack to the temple. Hush you. Luna said, sounding annoyed at his interruption. Room 3 is prepared, Guildmaster. The receptionist finally got back to her senses following Luna's outburst and answered her question. The answer however had an extensive effect on Ajax. Luna was the guildmaster of the healing union. No wonder Hatchet had seemed so confident in getting his arm healed, he would be confident in being able to pick up a quest at the Adventurer's Guild too if he was friends with guildmaster. As he stood there slack-jawed, Luna started hurting Hatchet deeper into the building. Close your mouth and stop standing there like an idiot Ajax. Hatchet lightly scolded him but this was all it took for Ajax to get a hold of himself and he followed after Luna as they entered one of the rooms. So, do you plan to tell me how you lost your arm, especially since you moved to that backwater to retire where there wasn't anything dangerous? Luna huffed as she started preparing a few gems and, to Ajax's surprise, 
started cleaning the stump with what smelled like alcohol. Also don't think I haven't noticed the kid. It seems like you finally found some adventure again after all these years. This will hurt quite a bit at the beginning, you'll also feel pretty drained afterwards, but do your best to stand still, she added before Hatchet could get a word in. Her tone changed to the clinical matter of fact Ajax recognized from doctors who were explaining a procedure. A strong glow encompassed Luna's hands as she held them to the stump. The magic clearly took effect as the flesh started to regrow and elongate. The closed wound split open once again as the white bone could be seen growing and extending once more, the muscle and skin only an instant behind. Hatchet hadn't gotten to take a good look or even prepare himself after her warning as a massive burst of pain radiated from his stump all the way through his body. The worst part was that the type of pain didn't stay consistent at all, shifting from pressure to burning to tearing. His elbow was beginning to take form as the pain finally subsided and Hatchet could finally watch the healing process with interest. For Ajax, the process was a marvel to behold. His ability to sense mana was, for the first time, overwhelmed. He couldn't get a good enough feel of the processes taking place as the wound was opened, cleaned, regrown, and created. Sadly he knew that he would need to spend a lot more time practicing with his light and holy affinities before he would even be capable of picking up anything useful to learn from a spell as strong as this. Despite not being able to learn the magic he could still follow the process. The first thing he picked up was that the spell worked in two ways. First, it would use mana to absorb as many nutrients in the body to start and regrow the missing flesh at an absurd rate. Only after the body started heading towards hunger and starvation did the spell change to creating the missing flesh and bone from mana. The first part of the spell was much less mana intensive, but seeing as how nerves were regrown and pushed to mend and expand it sent a powerful sensory overload of pain to the patient. The hearty meal Ajax and Hatchet had both had before coming here was doing was quickly consumed however. The second part of the spell saw mana take over the creation part with just having the newly made flesh attached the pain subsided. Ajax already started forming the basis of another discovery he would be putting forward for the healing union. The discovery that pain and a good meal could lead to mana conservation could be one of the most important discoveries, especially for situations where healers needed to act sparingly with their mana. So, how did you lose the arm? Luna gently pushed after Hatchet stopped being in pain. Salamander attack. Hatchet heaved out, feeling very drained from the spell. A few of the ones that were higher level than me managed to ambush me when they started attacking the village. I see. She nodded, a few beads of sweat finally appearing on her forehead as the wrist finished forming and the output of mana increased further as the hand started to take shape. What about you kid? Ajax he called you, what's your story? Ajax stayed silent for a second thinking it over before he decided there was no problem with sharing a little with her. Chances were that Hatchet might share quite a bit more with his old friend especially after she had regrown his arm for him. I am just a kid that grew up in his village. Ajax started. I was a bit enamored with combat when I was younger and, as I turned of age, I managed to convince Hatchet to take me as an apprentice hunter. With my ability to use mana, we then moved that into him training me to be an adventurer. An adventurer at your age? Something is definitely not ordinary here, Luna thought as she looked at the boy who identified to her mana as having barely aged a few months past ten years of age, if accounting for the five years most spent without aging once their system fully unlocks he should be close to sixteen years old. Did you come to the capital to enroll in an academy? Despite her slightly condescending tone, it was all an act. Even before the boy answered Luna had already started thinking of what she should do so as to get him enrolled with the least amount of scrutiny from the nobles. No, I'm here to take jobs and delve as an adventurer. The dungeons here are much more welcoming than the one close to the village. Age answered truthfully. Luna's whole thoughts ground to a halt, luckily she had finished healing Hatchet's arm so she wasn't casting a spell as Ajax's words left her flabbergasted. A commoner who not only can use mana but has already been part of the team to clear the first floor of a dungeon was unheard of. Hatchet couldn't hold back a slightly vindictive chuckle as he watched Luna react. Thanks for this Luna. 
Hatchet broke the silence. I would love to stay and chat right now, but neither of us have accommodations, and I'm guessing you weren't sitting around doing nothing as we came in this morning. What do you say we go try to find a place to sleep and we meet up again for dinner? Oh, nonsense. Luna quickly came back to her senses and denied. I have more than one house in the Noble District, you can just take one of them and use it for as long as you stay here, she waved him off as if it was no big deal. Not to sound ungrateful Miss Luna, Ajax carefully started talking, but I would prefer to get my own place, it has nothing to do with my impression of you, it's just that, well. I'd rather not draw too much attention to myself by living on the horse of the Guild Master of the Healing Union. Oh, that. You don't have to worry too much about that. She waved off his concern. Unlike all the other guilds, the Healing Union's Guild Master position is more honorary than anything else. I still have quite a lot of influence and pull for an individual as the person who started it all but with crown backing and funding it for the last few decades it's being run by a council they put in place. Ajax thought the situation over in his head, he didn't want to be rude but neither did he want to draw unnecessary attention. In fact living in one of my places could make you seem important enough to give you a leg up when you register for the Adventurer's Guild here, she pushed further. If you insist, then I shall accept your hospitality tonight and try to find a place of my own tomorrow. Ajax decided that this would be his best course of action, 